following is a broadcast of North Burlington Baptist Church. So, um, I want you to know I had a great time on vacation. Uh, it snowed just before we got there to Arizona. They had been experiencing 80s, and then it snowed. When we got there, it rained, and it was low 60s. But the good news is the day after we left, it went up to 80s again. <laughs> so, uh, if ever you want to have good weather on a vacation, find out when we're leaving and book at any other time. Because, uh, you know, if you want it raining when you're camping, just look when we're going. It'll be sure to rain that week. But uh, it was very relaxing. My in-laws uh, live in a, uh, a trailer park full of retired people. And uh, you, you know what? You can't do nothing fast there. And uh, I played uh, shuffleboard. I lost, but just... I relaxed. It was a great time away. Um, just a word, too, about pluckers. Pondering at pluckers is happening again this Tuesday. Some people have had questions about that. It's for anybody who has questions that they'd like to discuss in an environment they don't feel they can discuss anywhere else. So if, if sitting in a pub, eating wings, is your environment for discussing questions that uh, you don't feel you can discuss elsewhere, then come on by. I, I've, I've really designed it for people who want to explore questions of faith, uh, and so people who may not have yet made a commitment, and maybe that you've made a commitment, you still have questions and you just want to discuss, uh, maybe that you have a neighbor who has questions and you don't know how to answer and you think, well, you should meet Merv, why don't we go for winks? That's the invitation. So uh, it's uh, happening again this Tuesday, 7.30, every other Tuesday at Pluckers, it's down the street, and uh, it's my subtle way of getting winks. So <laughs> we're wrapping up a four-week series called uh, Building BFFs, uh, Best Friends Forever. And in week one, Diane talked about how friendships begin and are engaged by extending and receiving invitations, uh, some more formal than others, and, uh, and uh, there's all kinds of invitations into relationship that are extended. Uh, week two, we, look at, we looked at how unmet expectations in a friendship is like a half-open door. And for some, they slam the door shut because their expectations of the friendship are more important than the friend themselves. But for others, they take that half open the door and they allow it to open uh, and use that unmet expectation for their friendship to go even deeper. Then last week, we looked at uh, how true friends dare to speak the truth to the other um, in order that they can reveal what that person may not see about their own personality. It's a risky act of love, and we all need to have true friends who will speak the truth to us, even when it's unpleasant. So today, I want to look once more at Jesus' relationship with the Apostle John to see how their relationship was nurtured to become closer. And uh, there's actually just one point to this whole sermon, one lesson that I want to make uh, throughout this talk. And it's one action that's required in order to nurture and develop depth in a relationship. And it's simply this. If you want to develop deeper friendships, invite and receive opportunities to share in profound encounters. Now, to understand what that means, we need to properly understand what the word profound means. There are several ways in which the word profound can be used. It is, in its most literal sense, it means descending far below the surface. Uh, it means going far beneath what is superficial, external, or obvious. So we might talk about a profound insight. Um, it, it suggests an opening, uh, something that's open and a, a, a reaching a great depth. And so sometimes we'll talk about a, a gr profound gulf. So we'll say there's a profound gulf that separates us and God, something that's deep and wide. Um, it can be used regarding a topic of conversation. And so we might say that conversation was profound in that it was very deep and very serious. Um, perhaps the way in which profound is most commonly used is with regard to those things which are intellectually deep. And so uh, they enter far into a subject, and they, and they reach the bottom of the matter. And so we talk about a profound investigation, or a profound scholar, or a profound wisdom. 
another way in which profound is characterized is by an intensity uh, describing something that's deeply felt uh, is pervading and far-reaching or strongly impressed. And so we'll talk about a profound sleep um, or something that penetrates to the core of who we are, like profound grief. Um, and it can also suggest something that's pervasive or absolute or intense. So we might talk about profound silence. If you want to have a relationship that goes deep, you must invite and receive opportunities to share in profound encounters with others. Now, as you're aware, that's risky. But what are some of the profound encounters that you and I can invite others to accept and which others invite us into? Now, before I address this point, let me just say that um, invitations into profound encounters are not always carefully thought out. They're not always convenient. And they can often be quite sudden and unexpected. And it's possible that you can accept or reject an invitation into a profound encounter before you even recognize that it is one. That's very often how we stumble into it. In the Gospel of Mark, we read of this encounter. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Sometimes people will share something of themselves or an event which opens up an opportunity to push deeper. Uh, it invites a deeper inquiry into the topic. It, it's um, often a way in which people sort out uh, those that are... Um, just feigning interest in those who are genuinely interested. And if people are truly interested, they'll ask for a deeper understanding. Um, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and, and you're burdened and you really want a friend who's going to listen to you um, that, that you could speak about this thing that's burdening you? You want to unburden yourself. And so you might give a hint, uh, a clue, an invitation for them to inquire, to see if they really care. You know how that works, don't you? You understand it? So someone asks, how you doing? You say, oh, not too great. I'm a little down today. See, that's a clue. We want you to ask a deeper question. And what you're really hoping for is they're going to show some genuine interest in your pain, and they're going to sympathize with you. But you know what sometimes happens? The person will try and cheer you up without really knowing what the problem is. They'll say, uh, well, we've all had days like that. You'll feel better in the morning. I usually go down and get a cup of coffee and walk along the, sh the pier. How could they know what's going to make me feel better? They don't even know the depth of my pain. Or, or they may redirect the conversation so it's not about you anymore. It's about them by saying something, I know exactly how you feel. I've been down all week since I heard about my Aunt Thelma who's diagnosed with diabetes. Now, it's not that say that we shouldn't sympathize with the person whose aunt has been diagnosed, nor that we shouldn't care and feel bad for the aunt. The reality is that you are already, you're already feeling burdened, and instead of having your load lightened, it's just been increased. And sometimes they'll share something that they're excited about. I just got accepted to college. My daughter had a baby. I just completed my thesis. I lost three pounds this week. And when people share something that's significant to them, it opens an opportunity to engage with them more deeply. What college did you get accepted to and what program are you going to go into? Was it a boy or a girl? What was the thesis on? Congratulations, how did you manage to lose so much weight in one week? It, it may simply be an observation that invites further inquiry. I saw my first cardinal today. I saw someone's uh, stop and take off their hat when a funeral procession went past today. I know that person. Yeah. Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Jesus opened an opportunity 
for deeper inquiry. And when a few of them were alone, they inquired more deeply. They engaged a more profound discussion. I wonder if it was John's interest in those end-time events that Jesus talked about that opened the way for him to be invited into seeing the great apocalyptic vision that's recorded in the book of Revelation. Perhaps his genuine interest compelled Jesus to think, you know, John is so genuinely curious about the end times. I'm going to give him a deeper insight, a more profound experience of what I shared with him while I was on earth. Uh, Before I move on from this point, I want to quickly mention one thing. The person who owns the story sets the boundaries. In other words, if they say, I'm feeling really down, and you ask why, and if they reply, I don't feel like talking about it, don't push them where they don't want to go. You can let them know, well, if ever you do, I'm here, but don't push them where they don't want to go. Uh, The the person who owns the story gets to set how deep they're going to travel with you in the story. And often this is related to several factors, uh, how much time you've spent together, how deeply you've taken them, and how trustworthy you've been with past profound encounters. And to this last point of trustworthiness, uh, it's related to another boundary rule. It's this. Not only does the person who owns a story get to set how deep the story goes, they also get to set how wide the story goes. In other words, if it's not your story, you don't get to share it. If you want to share it with another person and it's not your story, get their permission first. Never assume that they've told other people. But conversational encounters are just one way in which we can encounter profound uh, opportunities with others. Here's another story from Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were also frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly... When they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. What's happening in this story? Jesus is inviting John, as well as Peter and James, into a shared personal experience. These times are exclusionary. In other words, they they are times apart from others. Deep friendships don't develop in large group settings. That's why we've created small groups, so you can go deeper. That's why we've, we've pioneered and are experimenting with soul care triplets, so people can go deeper. Because you don't develop deep friendships in large groups. That's why you don't know all my deep, dark secrets. But that's why my wife does. Not all of them. I'd like to suggest that Jesus is inviting uh, his friends into a deeper encounter with his own identity. He was allowing them a glimpse into his divine nature. And there are deeper parts to ourselves, our nature, our character, our personality that most of us keep hidden. But to a few, we allow them in. We allow them to know the deeper, uh, often darker sides of who we are simply because, well, we want to truly be known by others. Perhaps it goes without saying, but inviting people into such depths is a very vulnerable act. And perhaps it's for this reason that very few people actually have close, deep friendships where they're known. But not being known is also a very dangerous place. In an article, uh, Pastor Timothy Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York 
says there is no, no way to have a real relationship without becoming vulnerable to hurt. Christmas tells us that God became breakable and fragile. God became someone we could hurt. Why? To get us back. No other religion, whether secularism, Greco-Roman paganism, Eastern religion, Judaism, or Islam, believes God became breakable or suffered or had a body. Now, I know that becoming vulnerable and inviting people to know the depths of who you are is intimidating and scary, but it's a mark of relational strength, not weakness. In his book, uh, Invisible Men, Dr. Adis uh, tells a story about meeting a middle-aged man named Patrick. And although by all accounts Patrick was an easygoing, happily married family man who ran a successful business, he had tried to take his own life. And after some prodding, uh, Dr. Adis uh, finally got Patrick to divulge the events that led up to his suicide attempt. His business had steadily, slowly uh, slowed until he was unable to make the mortgage payments on their new house. Things went down financially from there, then the economy crashed. Uh, Dr. Adis writes, but it was Patrick's response to these events that really struck me. Rather than letting his wife and close friends know about the struggles he was facing, Patrick kept it all to himself. Over time, the gap between what people thought was going on in his life and what was actually going on grew larger and Patrick became profoundly depressed. He couldn't face working, but he also couldn't face telling people how badly things had gotten. Eventually, the depression became so overwhelming that he saw no other way out. How could I face them, he asked. What would they think of me? In their eyes, I'd look like a has-been, somebody whose time had come and gone, only because he couldn't handle it. But those were extremely difficult experiences you had, I said. Nobody could have foreseen the financial difficulties. I should have been able to. Besides, that's not what I'm talking about. I should have been able to handle it emotionally. Instead, I fell apart and turned into a sniveling little boy. What was I going to say? Oh, mommy, please help me. I couldn't let people see me like that. On the one hand, it seemed obvious to me that no man would want to see himself like a little boy asking his mommy for help. But then if you stopped and thought about it, is asking for help worse than dying? How far will a man go to hide his shame? How many Patricks are there who would rather suffer alone than try to break through the gauntlet of silence and invisibility that prevents them from finding the support they so desperately need? Scary. But it's scarier when you will not allow yourself to go into those profound places. Not, all, uh, not also... Note also, rather, in uh, Jesus' offer to let Peter, James, and John in on this profound encounter, he again sets the boundary. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Once more, the person who owns the story sets the boundaries. And if you're inviting someone deeper by letting them into something profound, you will want to set the limits. You may say, I'd appreciate you not telling anyone else this, but... Make it clear what the boundaries are for people if you're not sure they know. And I can't stress this enough because if the story is not your own and it's not yours to share, and I know that some of you struggle with this and you have a reputation of being a gossip. And if you have a reputation of being a gossip, people will not allow you to go deeper with them. It will prevent you from deep friendships. I want to address one last profound encounter that John had with Jesus. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. What's Jesus doing? He's inviting John into the depths of his pain and his sorrow. You see, he's inviting John into his own weakness, to carry his burden, to offer compassion. Presently, I'm reading a book called Washed and Waiting. It's a person's story of being a follower of Jesus, yet struggling with homoerotic desires. He tells about one of the first times he dared to let a friend, Charlie, know about his struggle. 
Listen to the encounter and especially listen to how his friend responds. There's something I'd like you to know about me, I began weakly. I told him that I knew I was gay. I had known since puberty or some soon after and had probably experienced some foretastes of my sexual orientation even as, even as a child. I told him I had prayed for healing. I said I just wanted Christian friends, including friends my age, peers, who would be there for me, who would help me to figure out how to live with a tension and confusion that at times seems overwhelming. When I finished, Charlie was quiet. Did you want to say anything else, he asked. I shook my head, wondering if I had already said too much. Wes, I want you to know that I don't think this is weird. But it is weird, I exclaimed. No, that's not what I mean, Charlie said, still quiet. I mean, I don't want you to feel like this is weird for me to hear. I always feel overwhelmed when people share things like this with me, like, why me? What did I do to deserve to listen to a, like a sacred trust like this, you know? When someone invites you into the deep, often hidden burdens of pain in their heart, they are extending to you a sacred trust. It is not meant for all, but only for a few to whom you extend an invitation to go deeper. When someone offers that trust, the appropriate response is compassion. Don't try and fix them. I'm preaching to myself there. The word compassion means with suffering. It involves entering into the suffering of another in order to lead them to a way out. Now, you might say to me, but I don't know the way out. What if you don't know the way out? Friends, Jesus' reply to Thomas is appropriate here. Jesus said, I am the way. We need only to bring them to Jesus. See, he is a faithful God. He, he is acquainted with grief. He is the one who suffered for us so that he can lead us through suffering. When a friend invites you into their suffering, just keep bringing them to Jesus. But I know what you may be thinking. What if Jesus doesn't lead them out? What if they just keep suffering? You mean like those that the author of Hebrews talked about who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection? Those who face jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. Those who are put to death by stoning, sawn in two, killed by the sword. Who went around in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. Who wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in ground. Who were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Do you mean like those who we prayed for who, who were not healed but were taken from this life? I mean, what if they invite us into their suffering and we keep bringing them to Jesus to lead them out? And what if they're not healed? And to that, I say, ask them now. <laughs> ask the author of Hebrews about those who he talked about who, who did not receive what had been promised. Ask them now if Jesus failed. You see, friends, life on this earth is not the final chapter of our stories. And we're invited, when we're invited into the suffering of another, and we persist in leading them to Jesus, he will not ultimately fail. Building best friends is something that is not done on the surface of things. Best friends go deeper, and they engage in profound encounters. They, they descend into deep, murky waters of intimacy together. Imagine two people, and they're holding hands, and they're saying, let's, let's go down. One might go down first, and then the other will join them, and maybe take the lead. But you can't have one going down while the other stays on the surface. Eventually, they'll have to let go. They have to descend together. They both have to share the deeper parts of themselves. And some people are very good at letting others go deep. They're good at listening and hearing, but they won't allow themselves to go there with them. It will limit the depth of the friendship. Can I just say that just because someone is unable to go there with you doesn't mean they're necessarily rejecting you. They're not necessarily rejecting your friendship. 
Sometimes there are wounds and pains that people have buried. Perhaps they're not even aware of them. <laughs> that prevents them from engaging those type of profound encounters. It may require more time, more safety, before they're able to share in those deeper encounters. But friends, it is not easy or quick, but if you want to develop deeper friendships, invite and receive opportunities to share in profound encounters. Any questions? Then let me pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we long to be people in deep, committed friendships with others, in deep, committed friendship with you. But the journey to get there is sometimes scary to us. Not just scary sometimes, scary all the time. When we have to open up and Go deeper with others. Let them into the depths of who we are. So help us to choose wisely, but help us to learn how to trust. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust those you place in our life and allow us the joy of knowing intimacy, even as you did with the Apostle John. Give us the courage we need that we might be able to have best friends forever. We ask this in your name. Amen. No, because it's not my story to tell. She's relieved. You know, sometimes we just need language with people. So if someone says, hey, I got to tell you something, but don't tell them I told you. Just say, is that your story to tell? Because sometimes we don't feel comfortable in hearing other people's story from another source, but we don't know how to say that. Just ask them, is that your story to tell? Have you got permission to tell their story to me? If not, go and ask them first. Or, or you know, maybe just hold off for now. Yeah, but it's so good. No, no, I don't want to hear someone else's story. It just gives us some language around here that we can use to encourage one another to do what's right. I know I've told this story, which is mine, uh, a few times, and it's not because I'm old that I'm telling it again. It's because it's a good story. When I was uh, in India as a missionary, uh, on my team was a guy who used to wake me up around 1 or 2 o'clock every morning because he, he was so burdened to pray for people who were far from God, and because I was the missionary, he figured I was too. So he'd wake me up at 1 or 2 o'clock, and he'd say, Mervyn, let us go and pray. And it was a flat roof building, and we'd go up the stairs onto the flat roof under the stars, and we'd pray. And uh, this guy was an incredible guy, by the way. He, he would start to pray in English, and then he'd tap me on his shoulder, and he'd go, and say, excuse me, but I must pray in my Indian language. And then he'd just, out comes this flood of burden for people who are far from God. And uh, every, every uh, morning, he, every, like one or two o'clock in the morning, he'd wake me up and he says, if ever you're awake and I'm not awake, come and wake me up. We must pray. We must pray. So one time I did wake up before he did and I woke him up thinking I'll show him. And, and he said, oh, thank you. Thank you. And we went up and prayed. One time we were on this roof and he says, what do you think of our prayer meetings? Because we would pray with the organization I was with, every Wednesday was a around-the-clock prayer meeting time. Usually around the clock meant until about three, and then everybody crashed, but we tried to pray all night. He said, what do you think of the prayer meetings? I go, oh, it's good. You don't need to pray. Ah, oh, he says, they're not good. I'm thinking, here's a guy that believes in prayer. I go, what do you mean they're good? He says, he says, prayer is like a lake. He says, we swim on the surface. The treasure is down below. We must go deeper. You know what he's saying? He's saying there's a depth of intimacy with God, but we have to go deeper to discover it. I always tell couples that I'm in counseling with premarriage counseling that they need to pray with each other. Do you know why? Because it's very hard to be in intimate prayer with God and put on a mask, and you expose a vulnerability to the other person you're with. One of the great ways that we can become deeper with others is to invite them into prayer. Would you pray with me? You see? Would you pray with me? I'm not asking you to pray now. <laughs> but I'm asking you to invite someone into that intimate place of prayer where you can come before God without a mask and invite them to be present with you. Friends, if you want to grow best friends, like friends that will never leave you, you have to take them places. 
that you might be scared to go. And so you, you begin by an invitation, an inquiry, just a little deeper, just a little deeper. Maybe just bob your head beneath the surface for a little bit. See how it feels. And if it's safe, and if they do the same, maybe you'll go on that next step. And slowly, friends, you will descend into the murky, dark waters of intimacy, holding each other's hands. And before you'll know it, you will be in a relationship with somebody whose hands will never let you go. It's true of God. He'll go all the way. And it can be true of some people on this earth. Don't be afraid to take the steps required to build best friends. Go in the grace and in the peace of God. This podcast is a service of North Burlington Baptist Church. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at info at nbbc.ca. You can also find more information about us at www.nbbc.ca.